The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Hey, welcome back to Blurry Creatures. Thank you guys for tuning in week after week. This week we got a great show with Derek Olson from Megalithic Marvels on the Lovelock Cave Giants. We lost the audio and we have the Skype audio, so it's not our normal top tier audio, but you can get the gist of the conversation. It still sounds pretty good. Just giving you guys a heads up, this audio is a little bit different than our normal audio. And also just want to say thank you to all the members who signed up in November. It has been member November. We've had a record number of signups of people who are supporting the show. Honestly, that's just a huge blessing to us and this podcast to kind of keep it going. Both Luke and I are kind of grinding it out in our personal lives. And so it's just really cool to see you guys sign up week after week and support the show. So yeah, if you want to support the show, blurrycreatures.com slash members. I'm still getting over a little bit of the uh, COVID stuff. You can probably hear it in my voice, but can't say thank you guys enough out there who supported the podcast, listen to the show. So let's get Derek on the show. So we're back. We're back at it. You were just telling us you have a new theory on Bigfoot because you're wearing our Bigfoot shirt. And I thought we got to record because this is when the magic happens right in the beginning. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the good old backyard of Bigfoot, right? In the great Northwest here in Washington state. And so, I mean, I grew up watching Harry and the Hendersons, hearing stories of, of Bigfoot sightings and tales, uh, even from some close uh, family members. So my grandpa, he grew up hunting and, and would go elk hunting every year. And so he shares this story where uh, there was one year they were elk hunting out um, kind of near Cleelum, Washington, way up in the high country, deep snow. They come out of their tents one morning and um, not far from camp, they, they stumble upon these giant footprints and they are like shocked so much. So, that somehow they got a hold of some uh, scientists or guys from the University of Washington who came out, took pictures, snapped, uh, or did the, the plaster cast molds and measured these things. I think if I remember right, the footprints were almost like, I think that they were like two feet in length. And so that was in the, I think that made it in a newspaper. So I heard that story and I'd see those pictures um, at my grandpa's friend's house on the wall, you know, of their big, encounter and then um my uh a close friend of the family his name was bob he uh would tell us this story uh where one year he was out hunting why is it always when you're hunting right um he was hunting near colville washington this is the very far northeast corner of the state and he was out collecting firewood and it was about dusk and getting kind of dark. He's by this uh, little 
lake called Beaver Lake, I believe. And he hears some, um, the bushes rustling across the lake. And he's thinking, oh man, here comes a big deer or buck. He grabs his rifle to look through the scope and um, he hears this noise getting louder and louder. And to his shock, to his horror, out pops what he says is a big Bigfoot standing on two legs. He said it had to be at least eight feet tall, I believe, and, you know, covered in hair. And this thing was just breathing incessantly. And he was so freaked out, he kind of stumbled, made a noise. The thing saw him and let out the famous blood curdling roar. Then it ran up the hill on two legs. So I grew up hearing stories like that and uh, just being amazed, never saw like you know, never had an encounter myself, but yeah, as I kind of mentioned, I've kind of developed maybe a new theory and let me set this up by saying, uh, you know, we, we hear the footprints, right? The hair, people often hear, uh, smell this, this, this horrible smell, the sounds. Um, And I've seen the, the Ron Moorhead Sierra sounds documentary that you guys often play at the beginning of your show. And man, that sounds to me like a primate type intelligent being. And so I kind of have gone from thinking it was maybe a a being that manifests uh, interdimensionally into our realm to possibly there's room for it being a physical creature. And here's kind of my working theory. We know that, you know, Genesis 6 clearly talks about how, you know, the watchers, bred with earth women, created the Nephilim. And then the book of Enoch and uh, even the book of Jasher uh, hint that they didn't just stop with humans. They corrupted the animal kingdom. All flesh, right? So, yeah, Enoch says they sinned against the birds and the beasts and the reptiles and the fish. And then Jasher says that, um, I've got it right here. It says the sons of men began teaching the mixture of animals of one species with another in order therewith to provoke the Lord, blah, blah, blah. All that to say, what are some of the most intelligent animals that God created? What would you guys say? Uh, The smartest ones? Dolphins. Dolphins is pigs. Pigs are smart. Pigs are smarter than dogs, supposedly. Right, but right up there with them are primates, right? Specifically, <laughs> oh, that's where <laughs> we're not I, playing along very good. <laughs> I was joking. I knew he wanted us to say it. Primates, Dude, pigs are like smarter than dogs, man. They're actually kind of right. That's about what that. I said. It's what I said. People have pets. Prehistoric pigs. Yeah, I'm thinking of <laughs> of primates. Uh, yeah, name me the chimpanzees. Like I, I believe it's it's voted the top intelligent uh, animal that exists. So. What if, working theory, what we know is Bigfoot is the progeny of, of the Watchers with primates, which might explain their size, the footprints, their elusiveness, almost supernatural abilities, and the fear that they induce. What do you guys think of that theory? I like it. I like it. I, I think after we talked to Gary Wayne... On our first time, I'm kind. I was kind of there, and I wonder if. Well, here's the problem, Derek. How do they survive then? You know, and and Tim Alvarino in our last episode said that uh, perhaps UFOs came down, picked up a couple of them, and took them away, and then dropped them back off. <laughs> so the 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 flood is the the hard part, right? Is how do they survive the cataclysms? But, I don't think I don't necessarily think so because. Just like with the giants, you know, Genesis 6 clearly says that the giants were here before the flood and also after. There was some kind of second incursion. So, and that's, and we're there too. We, we, yeah, just, we, just, we just actually had an yeah, episode, Nate. Yeah. With Doug Riggs. And he talked about the exact same thing. They were the here and then after, which is the idea that there was multiple incursions. It wasn't just a one time, you know. Right. Clearly, it wasn't a one time thing. Um, it was a one-time thing for the Watchers, right? Because they were in prison and had to watch their their offspring die. That was part of their punishment. The but it doesn't mean that this third of heaven that rebelled. There weren't more 
of the angelic class, whether you watch her class angels or not, mm-hmm. didn't, that didn't, didn't do the same, same dirty deed. Right. Yeah. Interesting points. Unless <sighs> were those the only 200 watchers though, you know, I'm saying it didn't need to be, I mean, it could have been cherubim or seraphim or yeah. any, you know, just, we've had enough discussions here talking about how the watchers is just a class, right? The watcher class angels, whatever they do, they were sentinels or they were, they were meant to be guardians in some ways of, of, of the realm or realms in that sense. I, th- I think that's a super fascinating idea that there is, you know, maybe, they, maybe there weren't dinosaurs created again or anything, but at the same, the same measure, it doesn't mean there weren't other, other experiments and ongoing experiments. If you talk to Doug Riggs, like we did last episode he would say that there's continuing hybrid hybridized experiments that are going on in, in some of the dumps um and alberino would say that some of these things are happening off earth in in craft and, and which i think is all all plausible um now that we know amazing subjects to say the least you guys have had some amazing guests on lately been digging into the show uh, I really enjoyed, yeah, you mentioned the Alberino. I think it was a Gen 6 uh, show you had not too long ago. And then I liked the Always Love It When Dr. Judd's on, man. His Temple of the Watchers show was a home run. Mm. So thanks for the constant entertainment, insight, and I'm just honored to be back with you guys. Yeah, we love, yeah, we love having you, man. We're excited about today and, and, then, and then the future. We've got, you know, for our listeners we have today's episode then we have a future episode lined up with derek to talk about the cyclops builders of the golden age and how that fits into into history and then also into the historical narrative right but that's not today that's not today's show yeah it was it was supposed to be today's right but uh thank you for your grace yeah i've been uh just going down rabbit holes with the cyclops and i've just got so many things going on it's just like I just needed more time. So thank you so much. But I think listeners will find that our uh, our topic today will be equally as interesting. Mm, mm. I've driven through Lovelock, Nevada many times in my life. If you grew up in Northern California, you drove through Lovelock a lot. Of, yeah. yeah. On your California, way. baby. Let's go. Yeah. So Rio. it's funny. You, you drive through these places and then later on in your life, you're like, oh, there's some wild history here. But welcome back, Derek. I don't know if we did a proper introduction. We kind of did everything... Normally we talk about Bigfoot off the top of the hour. You jump, you jumped right in. You know the drill, right? I know it's your gateway drug. Oh, yeah, so dude, I just wanted to give you a little, little uh, hi. We didn't have to ask. We're just like, hey, let's. Uh, normally we start every episode asking our guests if they what their thoughts are on Bigfoot, right, Nate? Yeah, yeah. But you uh, just you, you dove right in. You dove right in. Well, yeah. Tell our listeners you're you're doing a. Uh, obviously, you're with Megalithic Marvels. Your your main squeeze. And uh, you're doing a tour in Egypt in February? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, We are doing a tour. It's called the Megalithic Marvels of Egypt Tour. It is going to be amazing. It is, um, let me make sure I got my date straight, February 8th through the 21st. So 14 days of megalithic heaven we're going to be in. Our host is going to be a um, renowned Egyptologist, Muhammad Ibrahim. This guy's not just an Egyptologist, but he is a guy that's uh, a native Egyptian or can read hieroglyphs. But this guy, uh, like us, understands megalithic prehistory. And so that's the paradigm from which he leads his tours. Uh, so he takes you to places, points things out, gives lectures uh, in a way that um, – Anybody who comes is going to just have a baptism by fire in prehistory that there was somebody building these superstructures that uh, preceded the dynastic Egyptians. So cannot wait. Um, Man, if uh, anybody listening wants to join us, you can go to megalithicmarvels.com forward slash tours. Got all the information. And uh, compared to some other tours I've seen, ours is pretty affordable. 4,500 bucks. I've seen some Egypt tours for 5,500, over 6,000. So uh, pretty um, pumped that we were able to keep that price low. And again, we're going to all the top sites. Um, there's too many to list, but I'm super pumped. Our last main visit, we get a private two-hour visit inside the Great Pyramid. We're going to see all three of the main chambers, the so-called King's Chamber, Queen's Chamber, and the other chamber I'm blanking right now. 
but uh, it's going to blow your mind. That's all I can say. So mm. think about joining us. For all our listeners uh, that aren't familiar with Muhammad Ibrahim, we talked about him with Derek in episode 26. Uh, we talked about the pyramids. And so if you refresh yourself on that, I think that'd be a really interesting perspective for what what uh, Megalith Marvels and this tour and our friend D. Olsen are going to be doing in, in Egypt. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, check it out. We talk a lot about the megaliths, um, drill holes, the black boxes, all the, all the, all the enigmas in in Egypt that don't that don't make sense in terms of what the narrative we're being fed. So it sounds fantastic, Derek. Looking forward to that. Hey, appreciate the plug, guys. Thanks. But our but our main topic today, back to the red haired giants of <laughs> Lovelock Caves, right? That's right. That's right. And I've actually been to Lovelock Cave. So don't let me forget to tell you about my um adventure there. Okay. This is an amazing topic, you know, little, little background. I was one of these guys who grew up um, fascinated by ancient history, dinosaurs, giants, would ask my parents about, you know, what happened to the dinosaurs and where did the, uh, the giants come from in the Bible? And nobody could ever really give me a, a great answer. So just something I was always intrigued by, but just didn't do a whole lot of research. Around 2012, I think is when I took my first red pill regarding the truth of ancient history. And, and my, my eyes began to open. And I was living in California myself at the time. And I remember one day I was doing like an internet image search of probably um, ancient ruins. And I stumble upon uh, a photograph of megalithic mortalist architecture somewhere in Peru. It might've been Sacsayhuaman or Cusco. I can't remember, but I was, I was stopped in my tracks. I knew this was different. This was special. And my, the first questions that began to formulate in my mind were, how have I never seen this before? Why did I never read about this in, in history class, in high school or college? And so I just began to research, and I eventually stumbled upon two books. I'll give a couple shout outs. One was Genesis 6 Giants by Steve Quayle, and one was On the Trail of the Nephilim by Ellie Marzulli. I think I read these about 2013. And these books had a profound impact on me and really helped me to connect the dots to so many things regarding the prehistoric world, megaliths, their connection to giants, and you know the modern day cover up of history. And so, as I continued to research around that time, uh, it's when I began to learn more and more about the legends and oral traditions of the mound builders and uh, the ancient giants of North America. And so, one particular storyline that really caught my attention was that of Lovelock Cave. Because unlike a lot of the other legends, tales, stories you hear about giants in North America, this one involves not just legends, but newspaper headlines, accounts from actual eyewitnesses, including archaeologists, photographs, and a cave. And so um, that's why I get so pumped up about the Lovelock Cave story, because I think it's one of the best examples we have that giants did exist in America. And you guys have had a ton of guests on, haven't you, that have talked about the mound builders and giants in America, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 We've talked about that extensively. And I did read a couple of stories about the daughter of one of the, one of the Indian tribes. And she wrote an yep. account about that. Yeah. It was, it was, I, I read uh, probably about it. It's like a 10 page story about it specifically where they, they camped out on top of these caves. Huh? And fired down at them as they burned them out of this cave. I don't know if you know. Yeah, that yeah, I'm gonna get into that definitely. Oh, yep. Okay, okay. I, I pre. Uh, sorry about that. This is no, a no, preview. No. Just rolling that, rolling that trailer. Nate's just so excited. He wants to just take my storyline. He's ready, dude. I know. Don't let him do it. I, I've done the research, fellas. Hey, I I know Nate's ready because uh, I think I saw on Instagram you were out there target shooting. I don't know about anybody else, but it looked to me like you were getting ready for. Bigfoot, huh? the, the encounter to make sure you didn't miss, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Bigfoot knows what you're thinking, so you got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Nate, Nate's thinking about going to Kandahar and looking for himself. <laughs> so, the deep existential tour. There you go. Before I jump into the, the uh, Lovelock story, just for, again, quick review, has anybody in your show mentioned 
some of the accounts by famous Americans like uh, Abraham Lincoln regarding some of their quotes about giants? Mm. We haven't talked about that one specific quote. I think we talked about it in the, like one of the first episodes. So yeah, there's Niagara Falls, but I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if we, we need, it's been so long. Mm-hmm. If we did, if we did, then you can, you can definitely cover that ground. Awesome. So I'll just, yeah, to set this up so people don't think I'm totally insane. You know, again, when, when the first colonist settlers began to, you know, move inland and head West, they would come across these giant mounds and they would often excavate and dig inside them. And they would, to their surprise, uh, uncover seven foot, eight, nine, 10 plus foot supposed giant skeletons with often relics, uh, bronze ornaments, copper. To people back in the day, it was just, it was clear that this, this uh, culture predated the Native Americans. And then you'd have newspaper clippings talking about this stuff, reputable newspapers like the New York Times and the Scientific American would have, um, you know, like front page articles on some of these uh, discoveries. But then even guys like uh, Wild Bill Cody, the great um, soldier and hunter, bison hunter, and Abraham Lincoln. I even found something about George Washington. They all knew about the mound builders, and they even talked about uh, the giants. So the one regarding uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, he was one time visiting Niagara Falls, and he was just taken back by its beauty and power. and, And he was writing about his visit there, let me find it. He said, recounting the beauty of Niagara Falls, Lincoln said, quote, the eyes of, the, of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours to now, end quote. Hey, so that's coming from Honest Abe. So it's not just me. Okay, Honest Abe is talking yeah. about giants. <laughs> yeah. Would never tell, never tell a lie. And what do you think, Derek? Why do you think that he knew about these mounds. He knew about the bones. He knew about the history of America. Was it just something that people talked about back then, or he had an insider? No, no. It was, it was kind of like uh, I would equate it to Moses writing Genesis. Moses, you know, he's mentioned. He mentions the giants of uh, the Nephilim giants in just sweeping broad strokes, not going into detail, assuming that everybody back then just knew what in the heck was going on, right? They knew the gods came and it mingled with men and there was this hybrid race. And so it was like Moses was writing from, this is just known. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what Abraham Lincoln's doing here. And this is what we see before the political correctness of the press and the suppression of the truth involving the Smithsonian. Again, reputable newspapers like the New York Times would even document these discoveries Mm. um, into the early 1900s. And that's why there were so many headlines regarding these discoveries because it just science was more, it was the science in its true form was embraced way more back then than it is now, if that makes sense. I mean, and we see that with like these newspaper accounts, you know, they were, they were printing about it and then they stopped. It just seems like more, more things consolidated, condensed, the less people talk about things outside well, of the box. It also seems like that this, this timing had a lot to do with also the rise of, of, of Darwin and what he was doing. And it, it, there seems to be a complete, pretty concerted effort to anything that seemed to throw a cog into the, into that narrative was sort of tossed out. No, you're absolutely right. Darwinism is the prevailing paradigm that has become the status quo today in the mainstream, you know, archeology span science. Right. Yeah. And so, People are often asking, okay, where's the bones, right? Yeah, yeah. Prove it. Where's the bones? Well, you, people need to understand with Darwinism being the prevailing paradigm, you know, therefore any evidence that conflicts with the Darwinian paradigm, it's, it's shut down and it's really forbidden. And so if you, if you, as you, you know, research this, you'll find that there's usually a deliberate obfuscation to hide anything that does not fit the standard theory that, uh, you know, Native Americans crossed the Bering Strait and settled here, and before them, there was nothing. So there's this repeated effort uh, to clear the historical record of all references of this, anything pre-Indian, Caucasian culture, uh, and it works in harmony with, have you guys heard of the NAGPRA policies of the government? No. no. So NAGPRA stands for um, Native American Graves 
Repatriation Act. So what this is, it's a law that was passed, NAGPRA. What it does is it basically classifies anything ancient in America is Native American, right? And so we'll talk about Lovelock. When you go out there and you see the you know official state signage about this, it just chalks it up to Native American stuff that was found. Hmm. Um, so what this does is the NAGPRA policies allow the government working with the Smithsonian to come in and take anything ancient, repatriate it, means it yeah. vanishes. They Either they take it or they bury it, they say, in honor of you know the Native American uh, heritage. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Native Americans often will say, this, this isn't us. Um, this doesn't even look like us. Um, but again, that policy is used. And, and this will often happen where somebody will, they'll, they'll discover something and, you know, without doing their research, they call up the, you know, local university, they send an archaeologist. And by that time, it's all shut down, right? Hmm. They take everything and it vanishes. So what happened with Roger, Roger Saker in our, and when he, you know, when he dug into a serpent mound on his property, right? He, he made the mistake <laughs> of calling local authorities and they shut it down, made him rebury it on promise of fine if he actually ever uncovered anything else everything else was confiscated and it's and it's gone so we have a, i mean we talked to people this has happened this is not a this isn't some. this is, we're not wearing tinfoil hats saying this is what happens to everything that's why the evidence has disappeared this is actually what happens um and, and i believe like you know it's it's this whole the morality of it some of these things seem to be in the right place but the problem is that everything as you said, everything is classified as Native American. And we know for sure, and you cover this in what you do all the time, when we talk about what happens in South America, that the stuff that's older, these megaliths all predate the Incas, predate the Aztecs, mm-hmm. predate the Maya. These mounds predate the the Native Americans here. And then that becomes a point of contingency when, when we're actually trying to find the truth because everything gets gets put in the same pot. Well said. So the, love, the Lovelock phenomenon starts with the oral tradition. And the oral tradition alone is just, if you're into this stuff, it's so awesome. So the Northern Paiutes of Nevada, they have this ancient oral tradition that they've passed down from generation to generation that states that, you know, in ages past, uh, they went to war against a ferocious enemy known as the Sitika. Say that fast a couple of times. (laughs) And this, the, the Sitika or uh, supposed to be this prehistoric race of red-haired cannibalistic giants that would literally devour the flesh of their foes. And the Chronicle states that uh, after years of blood-weary battles between the Native American Paiutes and the Sitika, uh, a coalition of tribes, regional tribes, finally comes together and they go to war against this heinous enemy. And these uh, tribes coalesce around this cave and they push these uh, red haired giants back into the depths of this large cave, cover the entrance with brush piles. And then they uh, set it ablaze to suffocate the giants and uh, any would be escapees uh, were shot with fire piercing arrows. And so the tale says that these giant cannibalistic carnivores finally met their grim fate in this blazing cavernous inferno. Hmm. Amazing legend, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I what didn't it last like 2 or 3 days? They were like burning this pile in front of the cave. Yeah. Yeah, I believe I believe it did last uh, about 3 days, yeah. Yeah. So I could you could imagine. Are there and so they're barreling out of the cave from my memory, right? They're coming running out and they're shooting them with arrows as they as they try to escape, right? Like, yeah, yeah, they it, were using they were using this was their um, best tactic, obviously, because the giants would have been much bigger, stronger, faster. So with the cave blocking them in there and then the barrage of fire piercing arrows, apparently they exterminated the giants. Hmm. Do you think hmm. this is the last batch of giants in this part of the country? I think it's probably this is this would be a tale of yeah some of the last remaining remnants in North America or Catalina Island. A lot of people say too that that mm-hmm. was the last batch, and then yeah. the and then over here it was uh, 
yellow hair on corn island was like one of some of the last batch so they there's probably these little areas in the last couple hundred years what year is this again well again this is this is this is oral tradition so this could have been okay. thousands of years ago 5000 years ago i don't i don't think i don't get the sense that this was just a couple hundred years ago the corn island one sounded like 4 or 500 years ago not too long ago yellow hair seemed like it was pretty recent as yeah. well like well someone said I, I remember reading about the uh, Lovelock Cave that they saved a locket of hair, right? One of the giants, there was like some red hair that was saved. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me get to that. This is exciting. Hey. Nate's always trying to skip ahead. He's the kid. <laughs> he's, he's, reading, he's reading the end of the book first. Yeah. So first, let me say that uh, this word sitika is translated as tool eaters. And so in the Northern Paiute language, so tool is a species of like a water plant that grows in marshes, right? And so if you look at a map, and I sent you guys some pictures, um, if you look at northwestern Nevada like 10,000 years ago, it would have been covered in this prehistoric lake called Lake Lahontan. And when you go out there, you can see all these dry lake beds that did once exist 10,000 plus years ago. So according to oral tradition, the giants used these, the reason they were called tool eaters is they would make they would weave tool rafts to navigate this massive lake flee surprise attacks from the Paiutes and even legend says uh, they would capture Paiute women who would gather near the shore of the lake so that is the oral tradition and again it sounds pretty fanciful but then as Nate's alluding to we've got the written account so the legend of the red-haired giants really begin to spread like fire around uh, 1883 when uh, the chief of the Paiute tribe, uh, Chief Winnemucca, his daughter writes the first known autobiography by, by a Native American. And the book's called Life Among the Paiutes. And in her book, she talks about a tribe of barbarians that she says were known as the people eaters uh, who lived along the Humboldt River and would waylay her people and eat them. And she, yes, she goes on, Nate, to say that she had, when she wrote the book in the 1880s, she says, I have some of their hair. It's been handed down from generation to generation. And, and that she even had a dress passed down from her family that was trimmed with this reddish hair. How crazy is that? That's wild. Wow. Well, based on what Fritz Zimmerman said, you don't want to, that might be a bad thing, Derek having any sort of remnant of the giants or the mounds, you're kind of inviting something into your, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you want that. I don't want that juju on you. I, I definitely wouldn't want it hanging around my, uh, <laughs> my man cave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, fi- you, f- you figured the spirits do the, the demons of disembodied spirits, of the giants. So you're just like, Hey man, I got a piece of your old vessel here. <laughs> you want to come check it out? I got some demon fur. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think if the legend is true, you know, again, this was such a renowned enemy, such a ferocious enemy. To them, it would have been such an epic win that that's probably why um, they kept this hair along with some other things. So it gets even better. Ooh. We've got the oral tradition. We've got the written account. And then we've got the cave. So about 93 miles northeast of Reno, kind of situated in this outcropping of limestone, is Lovelock Cave. It it looks like an ancient fortress. And again, don't let me forget to tell you about my trip there. But in 1911, a group of miners are in this cave. And what they're doing is they are digging out hundreds of tons of bat guano. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, it's poop. (laughs) <laughs> that's right yeah. fertilizer fertilizer which awesome. uh, yeah. i guess is very viable back in the day you know so they're in there digging around and what do these guys start to find countless well-preserved prehistoric artifacts so much so that the university of california finds out they sent out an archaeologist named ll loud i mean i feel bad for this guy why would his parents name him ll loud <laughs> um, he goes out there in 1912 and begins excavations. And this guy, again, 
this is an archaeologist from the U- University of California, obtains over 10,000 artifacts and specimens. Keyword from the cave. Jumping ahead. 1924, another archaeologist named Harrington does some um, archaeological excavations. And then he and this loud guy in 1929, they write a book together. They call it Lovelock Cave. And this is where I've pulled a ton of information because I wanted to get it straight from the archaeologists. And um, these guys throw out a couple of different dates, but the oldest date they throw out is that there was inhabitants in this cave as old as 4000 B.C., Hmm. So uh, we've got some history here. Um, there was another, there's another cave actually not far too far away from Lovelock Cave. It's called Spirit Cave. I might mention this later, but there was two mummies found inside there dated at 10,000 BC by uh, the Smithsonian. So we have a very ancient region here, very ancient history. These archaeologists find all kinds of stuff in this cave. And a couple things I'll, I'll note is they find this donut shaped stone calendar with 365 notches. They find these elaborate duck decoys that are considered some of the, the oldest and most elaborate in the world. I mean, they look like they're taken from a sarcophagi out of Egypt and they're on display in DC at the Smithsonian Institute. Um, and maybe guys in your show notes, you could link, uh, an article I wrote on this. It has all these pictures if people want to see them. Yeah. Oh, but great. Yeah. as cool as all that stuff is, they found, they find tons of burnt arrow shafts. A pretty cool quote I found from these archaeologists is that they talk about how um, these burnt arrow shafts they found tend to confirm the Northern Paiute legend of the assault on the cave. I thought that was pretty awesome. Is there burn marks inside the cave as well? Like up on the walls? and Yes. When mm-hmm. I went there, that was the first thing I noticed that I was taken back by. Lovelock Cave, where it's at, I mean, it, it almost feels like you're on the surface of Mars, this region. It's so arid and dry. And this cave is in the middle of nowhere, like a fortress. And you get inside and you see it's it's a... It's a huge cave, but the first thing you notice is the entire roof is charred black. Again, lending credence to the legend. Yeah, so so you think that this cave, not only were they retreating in there in this one instance, but they were coming and going out of this cave for, sounds like, a long time, elaborate cave systems. And we, we hear about that all the time on our show, Derek, is that like not only these beasts underground, but people say the ones they still see today go in and out of underground. The rare sightings of a giant that still happen. They're coming in, going out of holes in the ground. So what's their obsession with going underground, you think, and being out of... I mean, if they're big and they're dominant and they're on the land, I mean, if that's the thing that's interesting is that they do go underground a lot. You'd think that they would dominate so they wouldn't need to, you know? Or perhaps... There's a the target on their back, and so they're constantly, you know, getting away from people. I don't know. So it's, it's a fortified position, right? You got no one coming up behind you. If you're constantly at war, and you're being hunted by the regular sized people, they're they're afraid of the little people, Luke. I'm about to say that. Actually. <laughs> Beat me to it. Yeah, I think yeah. If you go, <laughs> if, if you're at Lovelock Cave, it is. It's a strategic <laughs> defensive position where if you're standing outside the mouth of this cave, you can look out and see literally for miles. You could see anybody coming. And so I do believe one reason the uh, giants might have been in this cave, um, just like I believe giants once inhabited Sardinia. I believe it was an island of giants, and they chose that island probably kind of like they chose Catalina Island for defensive purposes. You know, this is why they used to put moats around castles, right? Well, even better is a full-blown island. It's a lot harder to get to. You can see who's coming. I think we've talked about this before, but yeah, Sardinia, they've got these Naraji towers dotting the island, hundreds of them. And they've got the tombs of the giants 
which is what they're literally called in the Sardinian language, um, where giant skeletons have been unearthed. And so, again, in a nutshell, as man grew weary, as mankind, I believe, grew weary of these giants um, because they were they were loud, they were obnoxious, they were devouring everything. Um, they became the hunted, and they began to literally run for their lives because it was about survival. And so I believe they fled Canaan, they spread out, they went to Sardinia, they went to the four corners of the earth, and they, they looked for places of refuge because they were the hunted, because people were finally catching on that these things are not only devouring all of our resources, and not only are they, they deadly dangerous, but I think people were catching on to their breeding program and what that was going to mean for the human race. And so people were like, like in this legend, were coming together, allied together to snuff them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we talked to Doug Riggs on an episode that's going to come out right before this one. And he says the second incursion happened in the land of Canaan specifically. And you say they came from this area. You think there's a, do you think, what do you think about that theory that there could have been a second incursion just in the land of Canaan specifically? And that these giants, ones that Joshua and Caleb and didn't kill, built some boats and floated out to places over here. Is that kind of your idea, your thoughts, or what are you thinking? Great question. Yes, I think um, I think that's totally plausible. I also think regarding how they might have gotten to North America, yeah, option number one is they, they flee Canaan, right? They sail to the Americas. Um, simultaneously, I think they also may have left the old world to spread their occult practices, you know, and just corrupt the native peoples of where they were going. But then number two, you know, as just as the watchers uh, descended on Mount Hermon, could there have been something simultaneously happening around the world um, over here to where there was a, a, a a descending in North America. And could this possibly reflect some of the Native American tribes that talk about the star men, the sky people, and giants? Um, ooh, ooh. Wait, so, yeah. Or is it a combination of both? So you think there might have been an incursion here on, in, on American soil? Let's get weird. I don't know for sure, but what, <laughs> even when you, when you study the... Um, you know, the legends of South America and Veracocha, the oral traditions speak of these white skinned godlike men that came down. I mean, when you study Veracocha, it sounds, it sounds definitely something like a watcher coming down and it, and it taught the people, you know, how to do blood sacrifice. And, you know, it seemed benevolent, but it was causing it was corrupting mankind so you take all that and i think it's at least worth being open-minded to the fact that maybe some kind of incursion did happen over here now I would, I would also say that one of the things i think that leads credence to that is the is really the obsession of those people groups with the plume serpent right which we also know prophetically the bible talks about the cherub and seraphim being looking appearing like plume serpents which i think is also fascinating in that sense right so that i think there's you know one of the things you didn't mention derek and which we had a show about is that the giants were also at easter island so i think that they did sail to these four corners of the earth to, to set up their citadels whether it was you know to in, for defensive purposes and or to spread their their religion of of the watchers and the, the worshiping of their of their fathers and and those demigods and, and the sons of God, as we call, as the Bible, as the Bible calls them. No, great point. I think another note on that: when you look at kind of different Native American tribes, people have done research on the Anasazi. You know, Tom Horn has done some cool stuff that I've read before. For example, the Anasazi, this tribe literally vanishes, and when you you know they were in the Four Corners area, and when you look at some of their petroglyphs. Um, I think the most famous is found on, it's in Utah. It's called Newspaper Rock. Uh, I know a lot of people have seen these petroglyph images, but there's what appears to be 
giant horned creatures that tower over the animals and the people that are pictured. And so again, if you're thinking objectively at scale, these definitely look like giants. They've got horns. You know, there's pictures of, I don't know if it's this one, but other of their petroglyphs, you know, they've, they've got the basically international symbol for a, a stargate, you know, the, the circle that goes inside. There's giant footprints with six toes on them. Some of these giant creatures pictured have um, like three fingers. So they're definitely humanoid looking. And again, that seems to correspond to some of the Native American um, oral traditions of giants coming through portals. All interesting stuff to keep in the back of your mind as we investigate this amazing topic. So where are you at, Derek, with some of these theories that are tossed out on our show? Like Tim thinks that basically these things these beings just roll in on UFOs and land and then come and go as they please. It's a very practical explanation. Do you think that they could be delivering, coming and going, delivering all kinds of creatures throughout the ages in different areas? Because it sounds like I thought I had a second ago was like spreading the seed all over the world. You know, it's like some of those annoying trees that just blow out those like little whirly dids and they just go all over the place. I have several in my yard and they're the most annoying trees on the planet, but they're it's, it's a, it's a great design in terms of its survival because you have thousands of trees popping up all over the place. Is that kind of what the giants are doing? They're just trying to keep the seed going, keep spreading it. And when they die out, perhaps let's, let's restart the population over here. Bloop. You know, I don't know. Just trying to think outside the box <laughs> a little bit. You know, I think, I think some of that could be possible. <laughs> Um, I haven't really done much research or thinking about, you know, them, them descending on craft and stuff like that. Um, so I'd have to think more about that. I think that's definitely intriguing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you Lots said you thoughts. like, you said you like, uh, Tim's Genesis six episode. So I'm just, I'm just going with it. Oh, no, I, I loved it. I loved it. It's it's uh, you never know what I mean, there's just you never know what you're going to get. I think sometimes it's easy to think they were just independent, just consuming the resources and there was no like overarching plan. But it seems like maybe they did have a plan. Maybe they were trying to do something. Yeah. And I think I think something else we can't forget is, you know, not just a Native American tribe. This could be any group of people or any person. But if you're opening yourself up to the spiritual realm through occult practices. I mean, what can't happen, right? And so if we're traveling back in time, thousands of years ago in North America, and you're a tribe of people engaging in sacrifice, blood sacrifice, occult worship, inviting the gods, from my worldview, stuff's going to show up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easy for us to forget that today in our politically correct 21st century. So I know those are some thoughts, but there was something else I wanted to share about back to Lovelock. Yeah. I was going to say a lot of people have said there was a museum and then a few years ago, there was no museum all of a sudden. Ooh, you know, this story pretty good. Well, <laughs> first I wanted to get into a couple of cool details. So these, <laughs> these archeologists, <laughs> they find, you know, these burnt arrow shafts. And then they begin to find giant weapons, fragments, and giant tools. And one cool thing that was found uh, at the mouth of Lovelock Cave is what they call a giant pestle. And a pestle is like this giant grinding stone. You know, normally it's made, you know, on a, on a pretty small scale where uh, somebody could grab it with two hands and use it to grind stuff. This pestle is massive, so big, if you see the picture, no human could barely pick it up, let alone use it purposefully. It's hidden away in a private room in the Nevada State Museum. And I found a quote that was really shocking. The museum curator there of anthropology, uh, Dr. Jean Hattori, says this, quote, we recently received a donation of a pestle that was found below the mouth of Lovelock Cave and it is extraordinarily large and heavy. It is much larger than we usually find. 
Uh, it was found within the Sitika territory. So this could have been one of the pestles used by the red-headed giants and might account for its large size because of the large people that were using this. Mind-blowing to me that we have a, a doctor, a curator of the museum on record corroborating a legend. What do you guys think of that? Hmm. What are they grinding? Bones. Bones. There you go. The giants are the grinding bones. fee fi fo foam. What are they grinding bones for? To eat them. They're like bone broth. They're really into their health, too. That's interesting. They're not. Yeah, the artifacts themselves that we've talked about they to me they prove that uh some kind of advanced culture did indeed predate the Paiutes here but then okay something else crazy is found by the archaeologists and i call this the humanoid and uh, did you guys get to see that picture i sent oh yeah yeah oh yeah what were your thoughts when you saw that ooh i mean I'm looking at it right now. You talking about the huge skull? I'm Don talking Monroe. about No, this is um this is a humanoid it basically it looks a little, like a little mummy. Looks little like mummy? an alien. Yeah, it's a little yeah. mummy. Yeah. Look at that. It's like a little person. It's like a gray. So, as I scoured the appendices of the archaeologist book, I was shocked to see this photograph. This thing was apparently I think it was you know, younger. It was wrapped in a woven fur robe. But check out the eyes in comparison to the body placement of the eye sockets, the smallest jaw. I mean, this looks similar to some of the Peruvian skulls that we're finding. It does. I was thinking that. looks like some of the stuff we see out of Paracas. What's interesting, Derek, is this area, something we didn't, didn't outline, with, is it looks like it was all back then covered in water, so it would be more like an island in some of these areas that maybe that's why they were specifically holed up on a certain part of Nevada because you drive through Nevada now, it's basically a desert. So mm -hmm. back then could have been like Easter Island, Catalina Island could have looked like that. Maybe they were taking refuge in a specific spot covered, surrounded by water. Exactly. Exactly. So you've got these, these artifacts, you've got this humanoid. Now let's get to the fun part, the giants that everybody's waiting to hear about. So mm -hmm. sorry, I keep just, jumping the gun here <laughs> no 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 there's so much to this story i just want to make sure we're not forgetting any of yeah. these layers because it builds a case right yeah again based on the oral traditions the the northern pirates they they would have been the only people at the time that would have seen these red-haired giants however there's eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the bones and skulls of some of these supposed prehistoric cannibalistic carnivores and so um let's start with the miners the guys that were digging around for the bat guano, um, they also talk about finding skeletons of large proportion. Let's start with this one. This one is only six foot six inches, but a miner named James Hart basically says that he found in the south end of the cave, about 20 feet deep, skeletons. And one was a striking looking body that was six foot six inches tall, mummified with distinctly red hair and very giant in proportion. So we've got that. And then we've got a guy named John Reed, who was a mining engineer. This guy claims to have found, examined, and measured several giant skeletons that were either from Lovelock Cave or the surrounding lake area below. And uh, so there's, you can find newspaper articles. I've got them here of him with a seven foot, seven giant, ten, giant skeleton. And then there's one where it talks about him, um, I think finding an eight footer. So pretty cool. But then you got the oh. archeologists in their, uh, again, book Lovelock Cave. They say this, it's quite likely that members of the crew excavating the guano took away bones, especially the skulls. The best specimen of the adult mummies, get this, was boiled and destroyed by a local fraternal lodge 
which wanted the skeleton for initiation purposes. <laughs> Several human mummies and parts of mummies were obtained by the Guano crew and the writer. Much of the hair found on the mummies in the cave is reddish. So you've got, again, the archaeologist saying, hey, there was red hair found on these skulls and skeletons. And then you dig deeper into um, old articles published by the Nevada Review Miner. That was the newspaper of the day. In the 1931 June issue, there's an article uh, of a eight, eight and a half foot giant skeleton in length that was described as having been wrapped in gum covered fabric, similar to Egyptian mummies. So crazy that you've got all of these giant skeletons again from seven, eight, nine, one, even almost 10 feet long here being described as um, that these things were really seen and measured. Sounds like empirical evidence to me. Sounds like they, they stole one of these and took it to Yale for the skull and bones initiation. <laughs> yeah. Or some Masons were getting yeah. slap, slap happy and, needed for their for their rights it would it would make sense luke that they would take a skeleton of a giant to do their right. initiations which is really creepy think about it. yeah it is. there's some weird think layers about, here there's some real weird layers think about their doctrine yeah see luciferian doctrine hmm. taking the bones of a giant the offspring of fallen angels hmm. Hmm. okay so so you could see some of this stuff just a few years ago. A lot of people have sent us links to this and the pictures to this. This is kind of up there with the Kandahar giant of how many, what people send us. They send us a lot of these photos, but there was a conspiracy theory that you could see everything you just talked about until like 2008 or something. I want to say. Yeah. Well, let me first say this. So I went to the cave. Okay. And again, I'm not a very touchy feely person. I don't have big experiences, encounters, but when I entered that cave, it, the word I guess I would use is it definitely felt otherworldly. Maybe it was just partly the smell, but it, it just felt ancient. If that makes any sense at all, it felt ancient. Maybe it was just, I had done, too, I knew too much. But it felt like, dude, you're standing on history. Some crazy stuff happened in this, in this cave. So let me pause for a moment and say I, I continued to research this crazy subject. And I got some leads on information that some of these skeletons, at least one, one of these that I might have mentioned here that was measured, seen from Lovelock Cave, was actually transported and taken to a little Nevada town called Virginia City. And it was on display in kind of a curiosity shop, like I think in the 1930s. And I was mesmerized by this because, man, to think that this one of these skeletons might have been on display and people would go and pay money to see it, like how insane is that? So I continued to research and I found some stuff that led me to believe that that skeleton was still in Virginia city in the basement of one of the old stores. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Now this is crazy. So remember I was reading on the trail of the Nephilim by LA Marzulli. So I think, Hey, this is pretty cool. You know, I don't have a blog yet. Megalithicmarvels.com or anything going on. I'm just researching as a, as a citizen. I emailed this to L.A. Marzulli, and I said, hey, I know you're always on the trail, L.A. This is something I found. I don't know if you're interested. I don't know if it's even true, but I just wanted to pass it along. Mm. Okay. At this time, you know, I'm just a fanboy. Of his. So to my surprise, he emails me back, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks later. And he's like, thank you for this incredible lead. I've gotten my, uh, some of my private investigators on this. <laughs> Long story short, he basically said, I am going to Virginia City to look into this. Do you want to come with me? Yeah. And so the crazy thing is, 
I ended up picking him up at the airport in Sacramento. <laughs> Sac town. Woo. In Nine. LA, you know, he's just he's just got this big personality. Nine and I am just like, I'm in awe that I'm picking up LA Marzuli to go on a giant freaking hunt in the middle of Nevada. <laughs> That's awesome. And so we drive out there. I and I had another friend with me. I'll never forget. So we have this is the best conversations on the way over. We get to this creepy little town and Virginia city is like a Western cowboy town. I mean, it is straight out of the Western days. We get to this store. LA had talked with in advance with the store owner who had given him permission to come down. LA like had his DVDs and book to present. And, and so this guy takes us into the basement of this store that was probably built in the mid 1800s. And as you go down this creepy staircase, I mean, you saw there was literally artifacts from the 1800s, cowboy days. It was, it was incredible. Well, built into this, it was the craziest thing. Basically hanging from the ceiling was a box. Like, and inside this was supposedly the skeleton. And so, like, I've got goosebumps. Long story short, L.A. climbs up the stairs to look into this box. It's hanging from the ceiling. Like, apparently it was so sacred, it couldn't be with the other relics. L.A.'s looking around, and not to be a buzzkill, but long story short, L.A. determines that it's not a giant. It is a large Native American. Mm. We were bummed. But it was still an amazing experience. Hmm. That's crazy. I remember dropping LA off at the Reno airport and he turned around and he's like, stay on the trail. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So I guess you could say he kind of inspired me to uh, stay on the trail and, and get megalithic marvels going. Dang. That's a cool story. It's like straight else. out of an 80s movie. Like, hey, kid, stay on the trail. It's exactly what he did. Stay on the trail. LA's a cool guy. Yeah. It was fun. He was an inspiring guy. And uh, that's a cool story. I mean, how do you determine if it's a large Native American or giant? What are you looking for? How do you know? Yeah. Well, after he looked at it, he let me get up there and look. And um, you, I mean, you could, you could clearly see it wasn't like, um, it wasn't of a, a large, scale it it wasn't even a complete skeleton so it was kind of pieces with a skull and the skull you know couldn't be no no bigger than my my skull so i mean it was clear to the eye that this wasn't you know an elongated skull or it wasn't a giant proportioned skull so la recommended that they repatriate it you know to the native americans and Hmm. that was bummer bummer I know, man. We we almost had it. We almost had a live giant or a skeleton, a dead giant. <laughs> to uh, we almost had one to photograph and give yeah. it, give the evidence. But but I'll say all that to say, let's talk about these museum witnesses that yeah. Nate alluded to. That's right. That's right. This is a conspiracy theory. Well, wow, that's not a conspiracy theory. People, there's there's photos of them. People there's testimony. Them. Yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. Yeah. So there's a handful of people who have testified to seeing giant, you know, giant type skulls from Lovelock Cave in a storage room at the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca, Nevada. Hmm. Now, I I went by there when I was in the area. The Nevada the museum was closed, unfortunately. It's not in Lovelock. It's in a couple towns over. And you broke in. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Two of the witnesses. Uh, who say they saw um, these skulls were uh, a guy named Don Monroe and M.K. Davis. And they've actually written some articles about it. Mm-hmm. And they've got the best photographs I've seen. And I sent those to you guys of the skulls. Uh, I think one of them was photographed in as late as 2006. So that was about the last time you could see these. But if you look at these skulls, you'll see that there's about four of them, right? And three of them were kind of yellowish, but in the middle there is a reddish colored skull that is clearly larger than the others. It's huge. Yeah. Okay. So I hypothesize that 
again, I think there was generations of inhabitants in that cave. I believe that that, um, you know, some of these schools could be Paiutes, but that that red one, I believe is most likely one of these red haired giant skeletons, probably from a seven, eight or eight foot type giant. But this thing is big. And if you look at the, the close up photo of it, I'm looking at it. Yep. It appears to have double rows of teeth. Did you see that? Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Huge eye sockets, huge cheekbones. I mean, it's got dearth. Well, it's good that you have, there's also, and we'll post these pictures um, in the show notes and also probably in our, in our Facebook group. So you guys can follow along, but there it's significantly larger. At least there's, there's more skulls there for scale and it's, it's big. It's a big guy. Uh, I just got giant skulls and eighties memes in my phone here with you. Luke. <laughs> 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 I like scroll it back and all of a sudden there's a WWF meme. Look at that. And why the red versus the regular color? What do you think about that? The difference in colors of skulls. Yeah. Well, we know they had red hair, so why not red skin? Hmm. Hmm. I don't I also wonder, I wonder if, the fi- if fire had anything to do with it as well. If there could be fire, it could be that, you know, maybe this red one or the, the, these reddish giant ones were at a lower elevation uh, where the earth was different. It is kind of a reddish muddy soil out there. So I don't completely know that, but to me, you know, of all the research I've done, you know, you hear so much about, again, ancient giants, you see newspaper articles, you'll even hear, I, you know, some accounts, but to see an actual photograph, this to me is one of the greatest pieces of evidence I've ever seen of possible giants in North America. Um, you know, cause there's several of these, you can tell they're not fake Don Monroe who took these in the seventies, you know, he's got his name on the photos. So I think we could be looking at the skull of a, again, seven, eight, maybe nine foot tall giant. And why do you think, uh, why do you think they've been, they were around to look at so recently when most of the time we hear the stories, this stuff disappears decades ago. That's interesting that this stuff stuck around for so long. You know, there's some other, there's a guy named Richard Dewhurst who wrote a great book called The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America. Yeah, we tried to get him on the show, actually, I think. Okay, yeah. He talks a little bit about Lovelock. He just he has a couple of pages devoted to it in his book. And um, this guy's an Emmy Award-winning writer. He's been on, you know, several television series and stuff. So I think he's pretty reputable. But he even says that it's been confirmed that these four ancient skulls Uh, and I think he wrote this book in 2017, so not too long ago, Uh, he says, are in possession of the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca. And according to Barbara Powell, the director of the collection, the museum is prohibited by the state of Nevada from putting the schools on public display because the state does not recognize their legitimacy. And this is why they're kept in a storage room and shown to visitors, you know, privately by request. Uh, she, this, this Barbara Powell also says that additional bones and artifacts were transferred to the Museum of Anthropology in Berkeley, California, and they're never put on display. So there's even more of these. So again, we see that the scientific community seems to be scrubbing all references to seven foot plus tall giants, anything, you know, red haired skeletons found at this site you know, and other sites. And uh, it's a repeated effort. It seems like to clear the historical record of all references of anything pre-Native American. Again, it's working in harmony with the NAG policies of, fe- of, the, of the government, which really seems to be, wor- uh, it's working on a, an agenda based in, of cl- political correctness instead of objective science. So that is the Lovelock Cave red-haired giant story phenomenon. So I'll, I'll end with this question based on all of that, all those pieces of information mm. listeners did the red-haired giants of love, love Lock cave actually exist. Let us know, leave a comment somewhere. 
Maybe we can do a poll. I'd like mm. to know. Yeah, we'll do a poll. We'll do an Instagram poll. Come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, the evidence, the evidence stacks up, man. And say it's fascinating too. Like the what I didn't know about this, Derek, and I think is really interesting is the idea that when you look at the age, and then you look at the fact there was an ancient lake there. And that falls everything lines up from the oral history to the to the narrative of the native people. And then you start looking at the evidence, the actual physical evidence that exists. And we know we know because it's been photographed. Giant pestles, giant skulls, um, scorched weapons, scorched weapons, burnt, uh, a burnt roof of a cave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hair dress. Dude, I we, know. we got it's, it. They made a dress instead of making hair dolls. I mean, but you know, you can't argue 10,000 artifacts, 10,000 10, artifacts, many of them secreted away, never to be seen. Yeah. And then we've got the, the museum curator in the Nevada state museum and the archeologist lending credence to the legend of the Paiutes. Yeah. So it is a and, crazy and, story to behold. And LA Marzulli just looking back at you and telling you what to do. Cherry on top of that story. Right. It's like, Fantastic. He, yeah. Stay on the trail. Stay on the trail. Derek, you, it's fascinating. Do you feel like that? that moment with LA was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to build megalithic marvels. Was that it? Is that the moment? You know, I think that definitely inspired me. It's one thing to do research, but to actually get out in the field and like, again, even though we didn't find a giant skeleton to find enough information that leads you to believe you might be onto something and, and to get to go explore in some creepy town and go into a basement. I mean, that was like, an incredible experience. Yeah. And it was shortly after that I launched megalithicmarvels.com just because I found that, you know, guys like LA had their books and their DVD series, but I, I wasn't finding any consistent blog related to the subject of megaliths, of giants, uh, nothing that was consistent, uh, let alone from a, a biblical worldview. So yeah, that's why I started megalithic marvels. And now it's it's kind of grown into more videos too. And you know, the Instagram thing. So I'm trying to stay on the trail, trying to keep up with you guys though. You're uh, you're taking it to a whole nother level. We are the memes. Is that what you're talking about? No, <laughs> I love the meme the game is strong. The meme game is strong. <laughs> I'm talking about the show that is blurry creatures. Well, we appreciate you, man. Like Derek, we, uh, you have the gift yeah. of encouragement, my friend. You really do. Yeah. Appreciate that. No, I mean, dude, you talk about megalithic marvels is huge. We're we're this we're the small guy, we're the little people, and you're the giant. And we're just trying to we're just trying to ride your mega <laughs> coattails here. Yeah, it's it's fun doing it. It's fun doing it in community, isn't it? And uh, sure is. Hey, well, let me let me read you a Josephus quote, maybe to wrap this up in a bow. So, Josephus, he was a first century Roman Jewish scholar. Uh, he was born in Jerusalem and then lived in Rome and wrote books uh, on the Jewish war and blah, blah, blah. But this guy in his books, uh, especially one of his books, The Antiquities of the Jews, he has some incredible quotes regarding the giants of old, the Nephilim. And so one of them is this. And he says, quote, there were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. So I just love that, you know, you've got, we've got the Bible and all the scriptures there that, that talk about giants and you know we've got enoch but uh here we've got a historian mm. from you know the, the first century corroborating that these giants were still on display in their museums back then mm. so we live in a crazy world where are the bones <laughs> where are the bones we can make memes like that forever. Derek, it's great. And it's, it's, you're always blessing on this show and dropping your knowledge. 
And I love your passion. You got such good passion. And I hope that your tour sells out. Everyone go to makealithicmarvels.com. Buy yourself a ticket. Get out there with, with the myth, the man, the legend himself. And go on that. Go on that tour. Get on Instagram. Find the Megalith Marvels. If you don't follow, you should follow. It is a must follow. Um, not only is it just fascinating historical information, but Derek does some amazing videos. He also has interviews with guests, not not unlike the ones we have here, um, but talking most specifically about the ancient history you can touch and feel and see that points to to a lot of a lot of uh, fallacies in. in to say the least, in, in our in our current historical narrative. Hey. And so we're grateful to have you, grateful to have you as a friend and a guest on our show. Derek, we're going to have you back to talk about Cyclops and the and the builders during the Golden Age. Uh, we'll get to that at some point, but thank you for this fascinating um, dissertation. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you so much for the opportunity. Love the show. Love coming on with you. And Luke, maybe um, next time you're out there in Arizona, in Sedona, I've seen your Instagram stories, live and large. You can take a little excursion over to Lovelock and give us a live update of what's happening. Oh man, you were right there. You're I'll right be the there. Lovelock giant for one day. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll post that poll on our Instagram. If you have any stories about giants, if you, there's several people, Derek, that send us messages like, my grandfather dug them up, but I won't come on your show and talk about it. I'm like, ah, come on. If you have any stories of giants i know they're out there i'm, I'm like you man i want i want to like be on the trail and and find find the bones myself but yeah even if they don't want to come on the show just tell them to send us the coordinates we'll take care of the rest yeah i love it well thanks right. man till next time thanks derek Good to thanks see you, guys man. all right yeah. bud roll that time <laughs>